Welcome and thank you for joining this week's webinar in the COVID-19 and Humanitarian Settings Knowledge and Experience Sharing Series. During this webinar, participant microphones have been muted. However, we encourage you to make use of the chat box to communicate with the presenters and to ask questions. Access to today's recording will be available after the webinar at readyinitiative.org and on the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs YouTube page. We are also pleased to share that this webinar series has been extended and is now concluding on July 1st. If you would like to submit an operational topic for consideration for a future webinar, please write to us at ready at safechildren.org or use the chat box during this and future webinars. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Senior Emergency Health Advisor at Save the Children, Dr. Ribka Amsalib. Welcome, Dr. Ribka. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome everyone to the COVID-19 and maternal reproductive health in human care and settings webinar. We are now on the seventh month of the pandemic with over 7 million cases and 400,000 days from over 200 countries. The disruptions we are seeing and continue to face in our lives, communities and way of working is truly unprecedented. In today's webinar, we have three panelists, Dr. Charles Amha, Ms. Diana Gare, and Dr. Diana Pulido, who will share with us the latest evidence and practice in preparedness, response, and mitigation efforts to COVID-19 and maternal and reproductive health. From what we have seen so far, COVID-19 has direct and indirect impact on maternal and reproductive health services, and it manifests and exacerbates existing inequalities in access to information, utilization of health services, and health outcomes. For us in the reproductive health community, there is a growing concern that gains achieved in the reduction in maternal mortality and neonatal mortality in the last decade are at risk if we don't act now and act purposefully to maintain and stay in course in our efforts to scale up maternal and reproductive health service, increase testing and care for pregnant women who are infected with COVID, and be intentional in our program adaptation to narrow the disparity that we often see in humanitarian settings in maternal and reproductive health coverage and outcome. With that brief overview, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Charles Amha. Dr. Charles is an obstetrician, senior lecturer, and the deputy head of the Department of International Public Health at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. He's a member of the Case Management Technical Working Group of the Africa Task Force for Coronavirus. Over to you, Dr. Charles. Charles, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. Some technological hitch there. But I'll, I'll try and make up for the lost um, 20 seconds or so. So I was just saying thank you for the kind um, introduction and for the opportunity to speak um, at this webinar. Um, so a lot has been said about um, the potential impact of um, COVID-19 on reproductive health. And um, today I will be talking about um, the evidence, what we know about, and um, some of the ongoing discussions. And then colleagues will talk about some of the practical experiences. Um, in their settings. Oh dear me. Okay. Right, so some of the key questions which I wanted to, which I hope that at the end of my um, presentation we should be able to answer is um, um, one, is there direct effects of um, severe acute respiratory syndrome um, coronavirus to infection on pregnancy? What are the direct and indirect um, effects? Um, what is the impact on um, reproductive maternal newborn and adolescent health services? How can we mitigate this, this impact? I think it is clear that um, going for moving on, um, coronavirus will be here for, with us for a long time. If we don't learn how to live with it and adapt our services and move on, then the, um, the cost will be high, especially in terms of indirect um, um, 
morbidity and mortality. Now, from what is known so far, most of the information that we have is based on expert opinion, epidemiological studies. Um, there are no um, really robust studies um, of cause and effect. So most of the information I'll be giving you is based on you know, the best available evidence that we have out there. At the current time, there's no increased risk of um, corona um, um, virus disease in pregnant women compared to the general population. From a large um, population-based perspective um, um, study in the UK, the incidence rate appears to be about 5% per thousand maternities. The presentation is usually in late second trimester um, or in third trimester. And this is because this is when the um, natural immunity starts um, waning um, due to um, the effect of pregnancy. In most women, pregnant women, the disease is, um, is a mild to moderate disease, um, which um, results. Mortality is quite low and there is no evidence of um, vertical transmission. I'll talk about a few studies and just highlight um, certain things from the studies. Now, this is a recent study published in June, one of the biggest prospective um, studies involving almost 200 obstetric units in the UK, involving almost 450 pregnant women. And um, here, you know, the things to highlight is that most of the women are above the age of 35, most were overweight, most had comorbidities, um, and uh, there, was, there, was 5%, there were five maternal deaths in this study. Now, there were 5% um, uh, were of the infants um, tested positive for um, coronavirus, and, this, and six, um, six, six of them tested positive within 12 hours of birth. Now, what are the risk factors associated with um, hospital admission for um, for uh, uh, COVID-19 in, in pregnancy. Now, from this same study, um, the risk factors are um, women who, the evidence is that women who are black of other ethnic minority ethnicity were at increased risk, those over 35, those who were overweight or obese, or those who had pre-existing um, comorbidities. So we're talking here about um, hypertension diabetes um, and the likes. Now, another recent um, study, which is a systematic review, trying to um, you know, look at the clinical features and presentation and the outcomes, um, maternal outcomes and newborn outcomes um, for women who had COVID-19 infection in pregnancy, um, it, uh, identified 79 articles, but only nine met the inclusion criteria. So we're still struggling here to get, you know, very good high quality studies. Now, what we have to note from here is that um, they, for those, you know, um, CT scan diagnoses seem to have been um, better in making the diagnosis compared to, you know, your um, normal PCR test in up to 31% of the cases. So that's an interesting um, thing to note. Uh, in this study, there were no maternal deaths. Um, 67, uh, about 64% of the women had preterm births. 80% had cesarean sections, but the indication for these cesarean sections were not because of COVID-19, but uh, mainly from maternal and fetal indications. Um, something else to note here was that a lot of these new units were admitted to newborn intensive care units. So if, we don't, if they don't have good policies for screening these babies and managing them in the newborn intensive care unit, you can just imagine introducing this infection and you know, the cross infection that can happen in such a unit. Now, there's a big question of asymptomatic transmission. Um, and um, if you've all been, I'm sure you've all been following closely over the last um, 48 hours, um, you know, a slight slip up from colleagues at the WHO about the message in here. Um, but, you know, what, what do we really know about this? We know from models that up to 40% transmission um, of infection can occur from asymptomatic cases. So we mean asymptomatic because they've tested positive, but they're not showing any clinical signs or symptoms. Um, 
There's a lot of controversy, especially in the last 48 hours, about a pre-symptomatic state and an asymptomatic state. Whatever the controversy is, you know, what we know for sure is that um, um, there is transmission by those um, who are, who are uh, tested positive but are not showing clinical symptoms. But the exact contribution of this to com community transmission is unclear. Um, some writers have described asymptomatic transmission as you know, the Achilles heel of the COVID-19 pandemic public health strategy. Um, and you, know, you, you, can, you can imagine, so you have people who are not demonstrating um, symptoms, but they can potentially infect other people. Um, you will not be able to pick them up by routine screening because you ask them all the questions, check their temperature, nothing, but they can potentially be transmitting infections. Now, we know that um, from a lot of studies in care homes and res long-term residential settings, there is evidence of transmission by people who are asymptomatic. So this is something we should bear in mind, you know, especially probably in humanitarian settings where you know, we probably will be dealing with a lot of overcrowding. Um, there's an interesting study um, you know, recently published, which, um, which looked at universal testing of all pregnant women admitted to hospitals. And this was in New York. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, the cohort of 215 women admitted um, during that time were all screened. And of those screened, um, only four had symptoms and they also, they had a fever and also tested positive, um, the, the PCR test. But 29 of the 33 women who tested positive had no COVID-19 um, symptoms. But by the time they were discharged, you know, three of these 29 had become symptomatic. So this may not be the same thing in every setting, but we know at that time in New York, community infection was really high. Maybe this is why, um, you know, this, uh, this was the case. But this is something we should bear in mind in our maternity settings. Breastfeeding, another one that is not so clear. No transmission in breast milk reported to date. The benefits of breastfeeding far outweigh, significantly outweigh the risk of maternal to child transmission of coronavirus. And so the WHO advice is clear, breastfeeding should continue. I provided a decision three there from WHO to help you make the decision exactly what to do. But what you should remember is rooming in, um, early skin contact, um, you know, continue breastfeeding, taking what you have to put all the other measures in place, IPC, respiratory hygiene, and all of that. So all the reference materials will be circulated. Um, so these are the recommendations for breastfeeding, as I've just um, mentioned. Now, what is the impact of COVID-19 on maternal um, health, um, sexual reproductive health? So looking at some very interesting modeling by um, Roberton et al., you know, this is just in June, um, uh, this last week. We know that um, COVID-19 will affect availability of healthcare workers, either from ill health or they are, they are posted uh, you know, to other units to help deal with, with, the, um, with, with, the, with, with, the, with the virus outbreak. So elective um, um, services may be closed down. There may be issues with supplies and equipment with all the lockdown measures. Demand for healthcare services may be affected. If women do not have opportunity, if they do not have the means of traveling for care, or they are, they are afraid that if they go to care settings, they may become infected, they may not turn up. And you know, there's evidence for that. We don't have enough time to, um, to discuss some of the results from the countries. So access to healthcare uh, services can be affected. And eventually this can affect coverage. So in this scenario, they worked on three scenarios looking at um, you know, different aspects of sexual reproductive and child health, looking at um, workforce supplies and demand, and you know, put different things uh, when you have um, you know, um, no effect on, on, on coverage, uh, small effect and all of that, three different scenarios uh, of coverage and what was the effect in terms of um, additional um, maternal deaths, which is, we're looking at maternal deaths specifically. So we can have um, nearly 40% additional deaths um, per month in the worst case scenario, and up to um, 29,000 additional um, deaths um, per country um, at three months, and almost um, 60,000 additional deaths at six months. 
So this, with this, like Ripka said in her opening remarks, we're going to lose, lose, uh, lose a lot of the gains we have made so far um, trying to um, improve maternal health. And, you know, a similar picture from um, Riley et al. also recently published um, modeling, you know, the effect on um, the availability of um, uh, long and short acting contraceptives, you know, is, is quite um, vivid. Now, there are different ways different communities have tried to mitigate the effects of um, poor access for pregnant women. And I'll just show you this from um, Nairobi in Kenya, you know, um, something that was put together by young doctors working at the Kenyatta National Hospital, where they set up a hotline service to provide um, um, antenatal care counseling for women, triaging, and use this to organize emergency transport during coffee hours to get women to hospital. So this was exciting, you know, um, to see this evolve and to advise them on, on this. And this was quite successful, very good feedback from women. Um, now, there's a, we're not going to have time to go into the clinical management guidelines. This is always changing, but really hot off the press from WHO, comprehensive document on clinical management of COVID-19 um, has been provided. And you know, some of the key points for pregnant women, um, uh, for women of reproductive age, women who come in, in, in for pregnancy and childbirth, we have to screen for symptoms. We need to check for a history of contact. We only admit positive cases if there's concern for rapid um, deterioration, but isolation is recommended and this should be based on local guidelines. Whether you have an isolation center, whether you recommend mild cases isolation at home, health facility, it will all depend on, on the local guidelines. Now, what we must ensure, because women are positive, you know, um, we, we have to make sure that they we provide women-centered respective respectful care. Individualized mode of birth, because you are positive, is not an indication for induction of labor or cesarean section. A healthy bad companion is recommended, but please, we have to ensure infection prevention control um, uh, measures and PPE training. And then, you know, this is not the time for moving about in the facility. You know, we have to restrict their movement. Um, once they exit from the COVID-19 care pathway, you know, you return them to the routine antenatal postnatal care pathway. So this is quite detailed in this document. So. This is from that document. Um, you know, it's quite clear what the pathway should be. Um, this was from one of the annexes. I will not go through it. Like I said, you know, you will have all the reference materials because of for the interest of time. Moving on, how do we mitigate the impacts um, of COVID-19? Now, um, WHO has provided detailed guidelines I've shown you there, which is about maintaining essential health services and operational guide guidance. These uh, interim guide guide guidelines were released 1st of June, and it's quite comprehensive. It looks at staffing considerations, pathways of care, patient flow, and I will just speak on two aspects that are relevant to our discussion. One is antenatal, antenatal care. We need to be able to prioritize women if we are really stretched Prioritize women who are in third trimester and those who are high risk. And you know, high risk already, we've talked about some of the risk factors. So women who are maybe um, obese, um, they have um, pre-existing hypertension, diabetes, and all of that. Um, we need to um, uh, re-evaluate our bed pre preparedness and complication preparedness plans within the facilities and with our clients. Um, because with COVID-19, a lot of resources may have moved about in the setting. We need to know exactly where to find what when we need it. And, you know, what is the plan to get to hospital when labor ensues? So this needs to be reviewed. Offer two to three months of recommended micronutrients and supplements um, to women who are stable. And as much as possible, if you can use digital platforms for counseling and screening, this will reduce, there's so many benefits to this, reducing your workload, the risks to staff, even your use of PPE, you know, because if you, you, you run out by the time you continue business as usual. So if women do not have to come to hospital, you know, you can use digital means. And there's a lot of talk now about um, telemedicine and all of that. Now for the newborn care unit, um, you know, it, it's important that if we're taking pa uh, babies into newborn care unit, we need to- And we have two more minutes. Yes, we, we, we need to be able to screen them. 
So I've talked about a lot of the advantages of um, telemedicine and I've given an example of a platform there, which, um, you know, you, if you click on that, it will take you there. But, you know, this really helps us to manage our resources. In terms of um, humanitarian settings, there are several challenges, overcrowding, poor access to safe water, limited access um, to health services, and with a potential of high attack rates and mortality rate. I think the very first um, webinar, you know, looked at this. Um, so I will not go into this, but it's quite clear that the strategy here is to shield, um, you know, the high risk groups. Somehow pregnant, pregnant women have been included at high risk groups here. But from the evidence, you know, I don't see why they are more high risk than the general population. So I would like to hear how this is happening in practice when colleagues speak. So just to conclude, um, in summary, pregnant women do not appear to have to be more likely to, um, to contract um, infection than the general population. Infection in pregnant women more likely to, to happen in second and third trimester. Pregnant women usually um, have mild to moderate disease and death is uncommon. Vertical transmission is rare. At, at the moment, there is no confirmed um, case. Potential impact of COVID-19 pandemic on availability on um, uh, reproductive and maternal health services um, will indirectly significantly increase mortality rates. Um, robust guidelines are available, which are updated constantly. So we need to keep up you know, with information that is coming up. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Charles. And that's uh, a, a good job in terms of uh, summarizing and synthesizing the latest evidence base. Um, for those of you who joined us late, please uh, use the chat form to write your questions, comments, or even experiences that you want to share with us. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Virgin Jonicot and Emily Monahan are going through that chat uh, and we'll use that for our Q&A and discussion uh, at the end. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Diana Garde. Ms. Garde is a certified nurse midwife and uh, currently a sexual and reproductive health officer with the World Health Organization in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. She's engaged in the Rohingya refugee influx response. Prior to her current position, she oversaw clinical maternity care operation in the Ebola response in West Africa. Uh, over to you, Diana. Hi, good evening from beautiful Bangladesh. Um, thank you so much for having me be a part of the panel. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to Dr. Charles. I'm, I'm very happy to see that a lot of what we're talking about is aligned and very supportive of women. Um, I do not have a presentation, but we can just leave it here. Um, and I'll talk through a little background first so that you know um, where I'm coming from when I talk about challenges and then our activities, what we've done. Uh, so uh, currently working um, under the global health cluster and I've been repurposed somewhat with WHO doing overall case management. Um, here in Bangladesh, we have about 800 and almost 850,000 refugees from Myanmar, and we also look at um, uh, service uh, uh, provision to the affected host community as well. So if you add that in, we have about a million two hundred thousand uh, people. Um, of those, we have about 300,000 women of reproductive age. And normally 10%, so in, in our case here, about 30,000 women are pregnant at any given time. Um, our facility-based delivery was historically very low. So at the beginning of January 2019, it was standing at around 32%. Over the course of 2019, we did really well and we were able to increase it to about 53%. Um, and facility-based deliveries um, uh, at at, um, throughout the camp at uh, primary health facilities. Uh, we were doing about 1,500 deliveries. That was the maximum reported number of deliveries that we had um, at the healthcare facilities. We have currently about 4,000 uh, midwives in Bangladesh and about 350 are working in the camps right now. Um, so we, we were able to make really good strides in 2019 doing capacity building and comprehensive SRH services. Um, and then we have COVID, yeah? So uh, just to give you against that back backdrop, what's happening today, um, as of June 8th, we had uh, 1,059 positive uh, COVID cases in the host community and 35 in the camps. The numbers are increasing, definitely seeing an upward trend. Um, we're definitely facing some challenges. So um, we have projections that we have received independent academic 
um, projections from both Johns Hopkins and London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. Um, and so just to let you know what we're, what we're looking at in terms of numbers of infected, the symptomatic cases that we can anticipate will be somewhere between 230,000 and 300,000 cases in the camps. And of those, we'll have 30,000 severe cases. Um, unfortunately, if, and this is opposite to what we would like to see, our health-seeking behaviors that we're seeing are decreasing. So compared to what we had in April of 2019, we have a 73% decrease in outpatient co consultations um, in April 2020. Um, and this is not great when you have sick people. Um, the other thing is when I'm talking about 1,500 deliveries in the facilities per month in 2019 as a maximum, what we saw in April was 711. So people are also deciding to deliver at home and not come to facilities. Um, so our basic mitigation strategies that we have for COVID-19 don't work very well in the camp setting. So the access to water, and I know Dr. Charles mentioned that as well, is really challenging. We, we, you can see by the picture that um, uh, people have to go outside of their shelters to go to the latrine and collect water and bring it back to their household. So even hand washing is difficult sometimes. Physical distancing, very difficult. And we're seeing a lot of rumors and mistrust to the, um, uh, towards healthcare facilities and healthcare workers right now. Um, and so we're trying to address that situation. Um, we know that social isolation, we're asking people to try to stay in their shelters to avoid uh, uh, large crowds. And we know that's a risk for GBD. Um, and so this is also a big challenge. And then we have, um, we've, we've cooperatively um, built or are in the process of building isolation facilities for, for COVID-19, but we have staffing issues and then we have access to PPE um, that is an issue. And that's a global thing. We, we recognize that, but it's certainly a challenge here in Cox's Bazaar. So what are we doing? Um, the first thing that we're doing is emphasizing to the best of our ability and at every opportunity that essential services have to be maintained. Um, there was a little bit of um, an attitude at the beginning. I think people were nervous when they found out that we were getting small cases in Bangladesh and they wanted to sort of shut up services and um, tell people to stay home. And so we've been pushing really hard to follow the guidelines, all of the guidelines that say maintain essential services. Um, part, there's a little bit of a problem too when we start talking about critical services because people are thinking that we're telling them just to do the most basic, basic, basic. But what we want to emphasize is you continue, and IWOG says this beautifully in their guidance documents, that you continue to do comprehensive SRH um, or reproductive health services until you are overstretched and you simply cannot do it anymore. And then you have to triage and you do the most important services first, the most life-saving services. So we're really working on messaging that and making sure that services and, and uh, primary care facilities remain open during this pandemic. Um, the other thing that we've done is we, we haven't written guidelines around clinical care because there are beautiful guidelines already written, but we have written an SOP around how people move. Um, so when they come to the facility, how we can see them safely, keep other people safe that are asymptomatic and keep our healthcare staff safe. So we have developed, and this was also um, interagency um, cooperation uh, between UNFPA and um, Save the Children, CARE and UNICEF had some input, and of course WHO. Um, and we put together SOPs of how you move patients in low transmission, and then there will be a shift, there will be a trigger that we hit when, when, we, when we see bed occupancy rising. And then we shift and, and it's, it's high community transmission. And then we have a set of SOPs for how you manage people and how you, what the patient flow is during high transmission. Um, so we are, we are currently rolling out a training. We'll be starting next week on this for both uh, project managers. So they understand how to support people on the ground and their staff on the ground. And then we'll be rolling out a training for our clinical staff as well. We are only ident identifying um, movement in terms of people coming for ANC, uh, PNC, uh, I'm sorry, antenatal care, postnatal care, intrapartum care, and then uh, emergencies, obstetric emergencies. 
Um, and we, we recognize that other things are important too, family planning, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, post-abortion care, all of that's really important, but we needed to identify how we can move the patients coming to the facility for those, for these instances. Um, we we um, have, so when you come to the facilities, we've asked that everybody uh, create an isolation holding area. So you're screened right at the gate. Um, if you are symptomatic at all, you're put into an isolation holding area and somebody with a better, um, like a medical provider or a midwife or somebody can come and do a better clinical evaluation to see if you meet standard case definition. If you do in low transmission, we want to move everybody to an isolation facility. Um, and so uh, we have what we call sorry ITCs. That's a, um, a severe acute respiratory infection isolation facility. So we can have them sit there and potentially be managed there until an ambulance comes to pick them up and move them. Our issue was if we have somebody come in, they're symptomatic and they are about to deliver a baby or they're having a postpartum hemorrhage or they have an eclamptic seizure. We don't want to put them in the same room as other people who are waiting um, and nor do we want to wait to start addressing and stabilizing the, the, the issues that they're presenting with. So what we have uh, recommended is that people also, in, in addition to the isolation holding, they have what we call a maternity red zone. Um, so people who are symptomatic can go in there, we can do a delivery, we can give magnesium, we can uh, stabilize a postpartum hemorrhage. And then either, again, it's depending on low or high transmission, we either then transfer them to a SARI isolation unit, or if it's high transmission, we may then just transfer them home, depending on the situation. So th these are the different scenarios that we want to talk through with our clinicians to make sure that they understand what to do when they're on the ground. Um, the other thing we're hoping is if, if the community is able to see that we're not bringing in symptomatic and asymptomatic people into the same room and treating them in the, like side by side, that will gain a little bit more confidence from them and they'll be more willing to come to the facility for care because I know that they're very frightened. Um, and rightly so, they, a lot of them have a very traumatic past. And so we want to be respectful of that and do everything that we can to sensitize them, that we, we don't want to harm them, um, that we want to give them good care, that we'll continue to feed them, et cetera. Um, Home-based care, uh, I'll just review this very quickly. I think I might be running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Are we doing okay? Can I? Yeah, can we run it up? One minute. Okay. So when we start exceeding our bed capacity for isolation, we will be sending mild, then moderate, and then potentially severe and palliative care individuals, including women in their reproductive age, home for home care. We don't have any other option at this point. It's the only option that we have. And so we're developing home-based care teams with linkage to specific services. So if they need linkage to protection, um, the community health worker or the healthcare worker can do that for them, link them to uh, uh, clinical management of rape uh, services if they need it, child protection, or if they have an emergency in their shelter and they need more care, can link them back to the healthcare facility where they can be stabilized in the maternity red zone. So this is a little bit of what we're working on here in Cox's Bazaar, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Diana. It's, it's a good overview to take us to the next presenter, uh, Dr. Diana Puligio. Dr. Diana is a health program manager with Save the Children in Colombia, working to establish sexual and reproductive health program for the Venezuelan migrant crisis in Colombia. Uh, Dr. Puligio, over to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, good morning from Colombia. Um, we are very proud to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. So let me know if you can see my slides. We can see them. Okay. So, so as I told you, thank you so much for the invitation here to the Grady Initiative, um, and we are very proud to be here. So I would like to give you an overall from our response here in Colombia. We have a section on reproductive health program for the Venezuelan crisis response. Um, this is the picture from March 2020 by the migration office here in Colombia. Uh, uh, we, are, we have about 1.8 million eight, um, migrants here in Colombia. 
and about 56 percentage of them they are they have an illegal status now uh, becoming a barrier to them to access some services and goods such as sexual and reproductive um, services this is a heat map where you can visualize uh, the magnitude of the phenomenon here in Colombia. The red ones are people that are concentrated more here in the country, more than uh, 1,000 people per department. Um, for example, La Guajira, which is the department that we are established, is one of the most um, overwhelmed. This is the situation of La Guajira. So we are uh, working here, and this is the fourth um, department uh, occupied by migrants and refugees and returnees as well. Uh, we are established in Maikau. Uh, Maikau is the first uh, municipality as in, is in the border that had the um, most migrants inside of the department. And uh, the other one is Fonseca, which is uh, occupied the, the fourth place. In La Guajira. We are a section of the health program and we have two lines or two, type of, two types of services. The one is the clinical services uh, which uh, we are giving them uh, for free for migrants, returnees, Colombian that they are not unsure. Um, ANC or antenatal care and postnatal care, we have this wonderful opportunity to give them not just for the low uh, risk as well as for the high risk, due to we have a specialist person always, a gynecologist um, giving them support. Uh, we also do newborn care up to two months, uh, family planning, uh, counseling within that service and delivery of long and short um, active um, methods. And also we do prevention, diagnosis and treatment of STDs. Uh, in the line of the MHPSS, we are doing individual um, group sessions, uh, counseling sessions with the help of uh, psychologists. And as well as we are doing case management but is focused on GBV cases. Um, in addition, we have intersectoral referral pathways with our sectors in Save the Children. We are here, five sectors of Save the Children. Um, in order to provide a more holistic intervention for our patients. So for example, we, uh, we, we connect with CP, with Child Protection, or IYCF um, for, um, in order to give them some counseling for pregnancy and postnatal care uh, woman, as well as for multi-purpose cash in order to give them some support. What was the, the main challenge for us and how to continue responding? This is our unit or clinic in my cow. Uh, so as a team, internally, we prepare a preparedness plan on four pillars. It was A, B, C, and D pillars. The first one was to ensuring or establishing a focal point for our COVID-19 adaptation. So it's one person doing the whole processes and trying to figure out how to adapt every of our uh, services to this uh, COVID-19 situation. The second one was the IPC strategies. Uh, the C one is training um, all the staff about clinical IPC or risk communication and the work team that for me is the, the most important of all of them. Talking about the IPC strategies, well, as you can see in the picture, we have a pre-triage area. So in that one, we ensure that in the, um, the pre-triage area, we early recognize suspected patients using these screening questionnaires that are based on the WHO guidelines. Uh, we are using the National Surveillance Institute questionnaires as well. After that, immediate isolation of patient, patients with suspect COVID-19 symptoms um, in a separate area is done. In washing area, um, both the isolation of the, nor and the normal entrance, um, sorry, both the isolation and in the normal entrance, you can see a hand washing area, which was, which was provided by the wash team and is uh, supervised by our nurses or social workers. Everyone has to wash their hands before the entrance to the facility, even administrative collaborators, other 
uh, collaborators from NGOs or providers. Everyone they have to to comply with the strict um, protocols that we have established there. Before the entrance to the facility, we offer as well as um, a medical mask to patients with or without suspected uh, COVID-19 symptoms. This is our isolation area. So we offer there our section of the public health services, um, including this own triage area, uh, where a nurse takes their vital signals and some rapid tests. After that, a general physician or the gynecologist or a nurse is available for the consultation. We are doing the same as we have been doing uh, for the time that we open, but now we, we are uh, adapted in this situation of the pandemic. About physical distancing, uh, we have been using some nudges uh, for hand washing and distancing and social or physical distancing. As you can see on the floor of the entrance, um, so we have some marks in the floor, on the floor, and in the chairs within the patients in order to keep the distance always with them, within them and with our providers. Medical mask, in Colombia we have to use um, a facial mask uh, in public areas or um, if we are in the streets, for example, even the clothes, they are available. But if you are in a facility, we have to provide them from the medical mask. So that's why you, you can see in the picture of the right that is in the isolation area that they have the, the mask. And as well in the, we call it the normal area, uh, they have as well a mask. So uh, for us, it's, it was very important to do the trainings due to this continuity or the frequency that we have been doing that um, the main hospital that we are alive uh, under an MOU or Memorandum of Understanding um, the hospital from Michael. They have been doing trainings for us and as well as internally uh, Save the Children uh, has been helping us doing that. So you can see that we have been um, in the in the picture of the of the left. You can see that we had on the back uh, crowded a uh, crowd. So now we have the distancing uh, between patients, and we are more strict with these protocols now because we have been trained, and we are doing capacity building inside of our staff and as well to other um, uh, sectors. Work team. Uh, we are about 22 people working as a team, adapting and solving the challenges, situations uh, day by day. And thanks to their strength and their flexibility, we could adapt the program and continue serving to the most vulnerable people. We have other challenges and opportunities. Uh, maybe we decrease our numbers, yes, due to the lockdown, due to the scare or the aware that they have uh, to go outside of the streets because they don't want to be contagious and uh, but we have more opportunities now. Now we are a GBB referral center for the local government and other NGOs because we are the only facility that are providing an integrative approach for them and also because we have um, the increase of the cases but as well of the level of the violence not just for the name the number of cases. Um, so now we are a referral center and we are very proud of it. Other thing is that we uh, have now, um, we are supporting now L an LGTBI population. We couldn't do it before due to this uh, pandemic situation, they have more needs and, and now they are increasing their um, necessities. So now we are helping them with FP or uh, family planning support as well as MHPSS and uh, we are referring them to other sectors of safe the children, such as um, multi-purpose assistance. And the other thing is that we are uh, refixing our um, modus operandum. Uh, we are doing teleorientation for family planning in order to follow up them and not to, to and give them some support, even if they cannot come to the facility due to the lockdown. And also for the pregnancy women, we have been given uh, some risk communication information uh, related to COVID-19 and as well as to the warning signs during pregnancy. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the... 
Thank you very much, uh, Diana, um, for, for giving us that, uh, sharing your experience in Colombia. Uh, we uh, thank all the panelists for their excellent presentation and open it now for uh, questions and a discussion. Emily, uh, a first question, if you... Yep, sure. So um, Dr. Charles mentioned a study that looked at birth outcomes in COVID infected, in COVID infected patients. Was there any relationship between the large number of preterm and low birth weight babies born to COVID positive mothers? That's the um, first question. Okay, do you want to go through, should I um, respond one after the other or we go through all of them? Let's go for it. Okay, fine. Maybe um, a brief answer, yes. It's brief. So in that systematic review, they only had one term pregnancy um, with a low birth weight um, baby. All, other, all others um, that had low birth weight were preterm births. It's unclear if COVID-19 contributed to the preterm births, um, but we know that um, in cases of um, severe influenza and MERS, uh, in, in the MERS um, outbreak, you know, um, there was evidence that it directly affected, you know, the cost of pregnancy. But at the moment, you know, there's no evidence um, to um, suggest to uh, support this hypothesis so far. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Um, Diana, or, or if you have uh, additional points, please, please jump in. No? Okay. Emily, back to you. Yeah. So again, for Dr. Charles, um, you mentioned that pregnancy is not a risk factor, but when, but then went on to say that infection is greater in the second and third trimester. Um, so there was a question asking, um, does this not make pregnancy a risk factor? So it would be great, great if you could just provide a bit of clarification on that. Yes. Thanks, Emily. So um, um, the uh, fr from all the big studies that have come out, you know, just trying to describe the clinical picture in pregnant women. Um, it shows that um, most of the women who will come into hospital for care, who are um, clinically ill, um, that need hospital care, they, they usually come late in second trimester or in third trimester. And um, there are two possible reasons for this. One is, um, uh, one is because of uh, probably reduced immunity at this time in pregnancy. The other one is, um, you know, if you already have some parts of your respiration compromised by infection and you already have a gravid uterus, you know, splinting up upwards, you know, that makes breathing a, a bit more difficult. So physiologically, you know, that becomes a challenge um, respiratory wise. So these are the possible reasons. So I think once women who show up with, who um, come up with symptoms in late second trimester, early third trimester are assessed, and um, if it's a mild disease and there is no risk that they will have rapid uh, respiratory deterioration, they can be um, managed um, you know, uh, outside the facility. But if there's any concern for rapid deterioration, then they need to be uh, managed in the facility where they might need you know, supplemental oxygen or other respiratory support. And just maybe to add, I think uh, the data we have so far is, 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 is primarily from, from European countries and Asia. And I, th I think the more we see the, the outbreak spreading to the pandemic spreading to the Middle East and, and, and African countries, we may see a different risk scenarios in terms of women being as, as, as traditional caregivers, they have a, probably a higher risk for exposure of, of illness uh, as compared to, to what we have seen so far. So in that sense, I think women in general of, of, of reproductive age uh, should be considered a, a risk group, um, just even broadly speaking. Um, Diana, do you want to add something there? I do, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think the other thing to mention is that um, this sort of the secondary effects of COVID, which may not be because somebody's infected by COVID, but because we're living in a situation where there is COVID and people may not have access to care. And so you may have something that can be fixed very quickly um, or you may, you may in normal times be able to go and, 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 and be managed for postpartum hemorrhage or for eclampsia or for um, previa, whatever it is. But in this situation, the access to care is really minimized. Um, and with the also, it, at least in this situation here where people are feeling very nervous to access care, um, they may suffer the consequences of COVID without actually even ever being infected. So this, you are also just at risk being in third trimester, um, just based on that alone. Thank you.
Emily, sorry. Yeah, great. Um, so another question for Diana um, Gard, actually. Uh, so what is the percentage of severe and critical COVID pregnant patients that you've seen in Cox's Bazaar? I'm not certain that I can give a number right now. Our numbers um, are, they're quite low in the camps right now. What was I saying they were? They are right now, we only have 35 uh, positive cases in the camps and that's amongst all populations. So we haven't had a chance to really, um, to really uh, look at the numbers and parse out who is coming. We know that men are coming more than women actually, but other than that, we haven't been, had a really good chance to look at the data very closely. And in fact, we don't have enough data to really come to any conclusions. Um, I think what we're looking at is about 5% right now of the cases that are ending up that are better that, that we are getting that are confirmed laboratory confirmed are falling in the severe range but um but i think this is going to be more retrospective as we get more cases over from my end thanks uh, thanks yeah. Emily. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a, a couple of um, requests from, from um, audience members, Diana, uh, wondering whether it's possible for the Bangladesh team to share some of the SOPs that you have developed um, more, wide, more widely. Yeah, I think so. Um, I just need some platform to share them on, so I would be happy to. Yes. Thanks. And then um, a, a question um, about breastfeeding. So. Um, uh, I guess open to all, all, all panelists. Given that breastfeeding and breast milk protect the baby from infections and viruses, what are the, some of the uh, what are some of the different organisations doing to promote, protect, and support breastfeeding during the pandemic? Anyone can take this one. I can start. Yeah. yeah. I can say that I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, Dr. Charles showed the manual, the, um, the WHO clinical guidelines, um, and it's very clear in there. WHO, I think, has done a fantastic job of promoting breastfeeding. Um, so not only in um, reproductive health guidelines, but also in the COVID guidelines. And then there are some beautiful, beautiful infographics that are available to anybody from the website. Um, that can be translated into any language, all about some, kind of the basics of, of, of what we strive for in non-COVID times. We also want to, to see a continuum during COVID as well. So skin to skin and breast, breastfeeding and um, not separating mom and baby, um, uh, delayed cord clamping, all of that is in the WHO package. So I'm really, I'm really excited to see them promoting uh, a really positive maternal health guidelines. Over. Thanks. And, and maybe from the Colombia um, scenario, uh, any experience you want to share, Dr. Brida? Yeah. Well, about breastfeeding, yes, we have been encouraging them about to do it, not just stop it. And as well, because we have the, the support of the program of nutrition. So we are linked with them and they are doing as well teleorientation to, to the patient, to our patient or others. And I, we have a coordinate inside of the clinic that we are going to um, dispose for them again, because we close it due to the lockdown and we, we wouldn't, uh, want to have uh, an overcrowd people, an overcrowding uh, outside of the units. So now we are going to use the, this is space in order to give them the support. I mean, the pregnancy and the postnatal woman. And um, yes, for now we are doing this teleorientation supporting and with the doctors and the nutrition area from Save the Children. Uh, they have been training us as well in order to, to encourage it to the to our patients. So most of it is information, more information, and supporting them to do it, not to close the, the doors uh, because we have a COVID in, in, under in the environment. So we are trying to pull out the meats from them and uh, just giving them more information about it in the entrance, in the meeting room. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. One last question, Emily, before we... Sure. Um, so you mentioned that you did online trainings and webinars. However, there have been concerns with online trainings that they do not result in the same competence development, especially um, compared to practical demonstrations, um, uh, such as donning and doffing PPEs. 
So the question is, did you consider, did you consider blended methods of training? Um, so combining um, the practical and the, the remote training? Good question. Yes, Beatrix, that's a really good uh, question. And so we've been really lucky here in Cox's Bazaar. We have access to the ISCG. We have a ISCG hub and they have um, uh, sort of transitioned it into being um, a, a training facility. So what we're asking for the most part for our trainings, what we're asking participants to do is prior to the training, they have to do two, one or two or three online trainings and then show us that they've completed them. So for IPC training, uh, maybe donning and doffing, hand washing, pretty, pretty fundamental things. Then when they come to, when then we do the training in person. And the way that it's set up is that it's, uh, it's roofed, but it's open air. So the walls are open and then we just distance people by, by row and um, we can fit maybe 15 people in a room and have good physical distancing and then have, you know, do face to face and have them practice the donning and doffing if need be. So we got really lucky in this and, um, and I think it's a perfect blending of, of training. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Any other panelists that you want, want to weigh on the trading approach that are being used? Yeah, I think that uh, due to it, we have this focal point on a person that is in charge of the processes. Um, she's able to read a lot and to keep in mind the, the main uh, webinars or the main uh, trainings that we have been doing. So she is a supported uh, uh, a person that is supporting everything inside of the facility and to the health providers. Um, yes, it's maybe we cannot do face to face, but we are doing maybe the same as Diane Gard, um, uh, doing like a pre-train uh, before you have to be involved in one of the main uh, that we have been doing. For example, we serve the children internally. So yes, we do a pre-test and then we do the, the training and then we have a post-test. Uh, um, test in order to see the, the, the increase of the, the knowledge. All right, thank you very much. We are at time. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Paul uh, Spiegel, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today and I encourage us all to join the Intelligence Working Group for Reproductive and Humanitarian Settings, the IWAG Forum, uh, to continue the dialogue and further our thinking and practice on COVID-19 and maternal reproductive health. Uh, stay safe. Thank you. And over to you, Paul. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. Thank you, Ribka. And thank you very much, Charles, Diana, and Diana. That was uh, really, really good. Very, very interesting. And every time we have these webinars, one, of course, learning, but also we see um, the variations and the adaptations in the field, which is just really so interesting. Um, thank you all for listening. Next week, we will be um, our next the subject will be non-communicable diseases and COVID in humanitarian settings. And we have two more slots available. So if anyone is interested or has certain topics that we haven't covered, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay well and see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks everyone. And for the guidelines, please send it back to Ryan and we'll make sure it's disseminated. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jess. Let's see if I can.